Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good morning to those on the West Coast. We are so excited to be having this conversation today with Leader Abrams uh, about a Southern progressive strategy. We really appreciate the Roosevelt Institute for hosting this conversation uh, and hosting the Southern Economic Advancement Project. Um, you know Stacey Abrams from such films as All In, The Fight for Democracy. Uh, you know her from her seven or eight jobs that she uh, wields incredibly uh, well from directing fair count to fair vote, single-handedly trying to protect our democracy and our census. Um, but uh, for her purposes today, she has yet another title, um, which is a daughter of the South, um, a title she has used for herself. And uh, she is the executive director of a really important new initiative called the Southern Economic Advancement Project. As you know, Leader Abrams served for 10 years in the Georgia State Legislature, uh, six or seven of those years uh, as minority leader, an incredibly important uh, position where she proved very effective on everything from protecting voting to uh, education to so many other things. Um, she did grow up in Mississippi. Her parents have roots there. Uh, she then later grew up uh, the high school years, I believe, in Atlanta, and has, of course, uh, served in government there. Um, we are so excited to have her today uh, in this capacity, and we really wanted to start by asking her to asking you, Stacy, to say a little bit about what the term South means to you, um, why uh, you have started something called the Southern Economic Advancement Project, what it means in your terms to be a daughter of the South. So with this, I would like to introduce the amazing, indefatigable Stacy Abrams and ask her to uh, begin the conversation. Thanks. Thank you, Tom, so much for a very generous introduction. I also want to say thank you to the Roosevelt Institute for housing uh, the Southern Economic Advancement Project. As many of you know, when I did not become governor in 2018, I had some time on my hands. So I really wanted to focus on the work I would have done had I become governor. But I also wanted to focus on the challenges to bringing that work to fruition. And so I launched Fair Fight, uh, our initiative to secure free and fair elections across the country, fair count, which focuses on leveraging the 2020 census as not simply, not, not simply in assuring that we have an accurate count in 2020, but making certain that we leverage the process of the census and the consequences of the census as a civic engagement tool for the next decade. Uh, but one piece, fair fight, is about how you shape democracy. Fair count is about the input but what has always driven me is the output. What do we do? What do we, how do we serve? And that is why I created the Southern Economic Advancement Project uh, of which I serve as executive director. And for me, making it the Southern Economic Advancement Project was very simple. As you said, I am a daughter of the South. I was technically born in Wisconsin. I, I did, I lived there for three years, but my parents are from Hattiesburg, Mississippi. They moved us home when my mom finished grad school. And so I spent three years in Wisconsin but really grew up in Mississippi and then moved to Georgia when my parents became Methodist ministers and went to Emory for grad school. So I finished college in, finished high school and college in Georgia, went to Texas for grad school, went to New Haven for law school, but came back South as soon as humanly possible uh, because I love the South. It is who I am. It is in my blood. And I think when we talk about the South, we are talking about a region that is one of the fastest growing parts of our country, the South and Southwest, are the two fastest growing sections of the country. And that means so many of the challenges we face that the South in particular has faced since its inception, that those challenges have to start to be addressed because our population growth demands that we finally meet those challenges head on. And the other piece is in, it's innate. It is the notion of what it means to be in the South, to be a Southerner. It is a region of contradictions. It is a region where we have innovation, where we saw the first programs to guarantee you know, college education, where we saw innovation in childhood education. It's a place where we saw the birth of the civil rights movement, the cradle of this conversation about how we all belong. It's where 58% of black Americans live. But the South is also a place that gave birth to the redemption that followed reconstruction that gave birth, unfortunately, to what we call Jim Crow, which was essentially legalized segregation for 150 years. It is a region that has unfortunately 
underserved its communities, overly incarcerated them, undereducated them. And it's a place where those contradictions come into sharp relief every single day, never more so than during COVID-19. And so for me, I look at the contrast, this hope and innovation that butts up against poverty and unfortunately underestimation. And my belief is that we can lift up our, our successes and we can innovate our challenges into opportunity. And so for me, the South is about promise. It is where we can go to see how we, not only as a region, but as a nation can be stronger. Thank you so much for that. I, you know, as someone who grew up in Charlottesville, Virginia, I think we use the term Southern often the way that we too often see reporters use the word evangelical when they really mean white evangelical and erase millions of people of faith who believe different things politically and theologically. And similar with South, that we continue to erase this incredibly proud and inspiring Black Southern tradition um, uh, by how we how that word lands with us. And I noticed even in talking about this event today, the term Southern strategy is so uh, charged that we end up having to say a progressive Southern strategy. And even that sounds, uh, you know, jarring to the ear given the, the complex history. And we see this at a moment when COVID is ravaging through the country. And I'm curious the ways in which COVID has been experienced differently in the South than other parts of the country and what both current and underlying dynamics we see at play that are uniquely Southern in that. Well, to your point about the, the contradictory language and the loaded terminology, we know that the South is actually one of the most diverse regions in the nation, that the fastest growing Asian American populations are in the South and Southwest, that the, as I said, Black community, 58% of Black Americans live in the South. We know that we have one of the highest Hispanic populations in the nation. And when you think about that, the diversity of the South is incredibly real. The layer I put on top of that is that when we talk about rural South, there is automatically this image of white rural Southerners, but a third of rural Georgia is Black. We know a quarter of it is, native, is Latino. And if you stretch that out across the entirety of the South, you will see a diversity in rural communities that is incredibly, uh, op has incredible opportunity. But in the midst of COVID, what we have seen is that the worst impulses and the worst instincts that come along with this notion of what the South is have been made real. We know that in the South, we had disproportionate effects of COVID-19, both in terms of economics and in terms of health outcomes on communities of color, but also on the poor. And the reality is in the South, poverty is an equal opportunity offender. We have the poorest communities in the nation in the South. We have the communities that have the least likelihood of having protection in their jobs uh, in the South. We have very few worker protections. We have the weakest social safety net. And in the midst of a global pandemic, this is the moment where a social safety net is necessary. And yet we have seen the weakest opportunities for access to unemployment benefits. We have seen the weakest access to healthcare benefits. We know that of the states that have refused to expand Medicaid, they are mostly located in the South. We also know that rural hospitals continue to shut down in the South, even in the midst of a global healthcare pandemic. And so what we know about COVID-19 is that it has ravaged communities of color disproportionately across the country, but very much ex it's exacerbated in the South. And that is Black and Latino. And unfortunately, it's creeping into the Asian American population. We know that the economic crisis has hurt those communities more, especially communities of color and poor communities who are often our frontline workers. And so when you think about all of the collapses of our system and all of the weaknesses in those systems, the people who are the least able to withstand COVID have been unfortunately disproportionately affected by it. And then you layer on top of that, the effect of a natural disaster in the midst of COVID, and that has happened now three times in the South. And those are the populations that do not have the wherewithal to escape, do not have the ability to isolate and quarantine, which is what you need to do during a pandemic. And so we've seen COVID take existing challenges and unfortunately amplify the weaknesses in our social safety net, but also in just the infrastructure of our public systems. And in the South, unfortunately, the weaknesses of our public systems have been laid bare for all to see. And unfortunately, we have not seen a sufficient amount of response from those who've been charged with leadership. So 
is this primarily going to be a federal need to be a federal response uh, as a progressive strategy? Is this city or state level? You've worked at all levels of this. Um, we think about when you're looking at what's going to bring this uh, strong economic future, where do you see, uh, where will that be led from in terms of levels of government? So when we launched South Strong, which is our initiative to really anticipate what does recovery look like in the South, and let's be clear, we know that COVID-19 has affected every single region, every single community. But what is unique for the South is the weakness of our public infrastructure and unfortunately the effectiveness and the surging in, of COVID-19 in our region. And so across the South, we know that this is a both and situation, both in terms of acknowledging the challenges and preparing a solution. So we have convened through South Strong more than 150 organizations that work at every single level of government. At the federal level, we know the resources that are largely going to provide for recovery are gonna be federal in nature. But the issue is, are they going to be targeted and will they be accessible by those who need them most? So let's take two examples. If we're thinking about the issue of jobs, Many, many people in the South and a lot of communities of color are employed by small businesses, disproportionately so. And yet black small businesses are the least likely to receive aid through the PPP programs that were pushed out during the CARES Act. We know Latino businesses faced a, a similar difficulty. We know that AAPI businesses fared slightly better, but only marginally so. And that means that when the resources are divvied up, we know that our communities, unless we are prepared for a very strong federal push will likely not receive the benefit that will sound wonderful in macro, but will be very limited in micro. The second issue would be when we think about the healthcare cost. Often those dollars are federally funded, but state administered. And unfortunately, most Southern states, eight of them have refused to expand Medicaid. That means that the communities that are the most need, the greatest need, not only for healthcare benefits, through Medicaid for treatment of COVID, but for treatment of those underlying diseases that make them more susceptible to COVID, those dollars aren't available, even though, the, I mean, so those dollars can't be spent, even though they're federally available. So the federal government has done its part, but it's state leadership that we need to actually accept those dollars. And then on the local level, we have watched mayors like Mayor of Birmingham try to meet the moment of reaching the, those who are the most disconnected from our social safety net and from our ecosystem. And those mayors, those city council members, those school board members need support, but they also need leadership. We know that in the South, when COVID-19 hit, it has been Southern governors that have been the most recalcitrant about following basic science. They have been the, the least likely to actually issue edicts to wear masks, which we know saves thousands of lives. Unfortunately, I live in a state where the governor was perplexed by asymptomatic treatment or asymptomatic transmission of the disease, and he sued our city and county government to block them from actually trying to solve the problem. And while he got the greatest attention for it, we actually know that this tendency to dismiss the science of COVID-19 has actually pervaded the South. And so the very short answer to your, your question is, it's going to take all of the above. We have to have federal, state, and local investment, leadership, and resources if we are going to recover from COVID-19. But more importantly, if we are going to do what, you know, it sounds very cynical, but if the best opportunities sometimes come out of solving a crisis, and the crisis of COVID for the South have, again, as I said before, laid bare the infrastructure issues, a progressive Southern strategy says, let's take advantage of this new attention but also of these very clear controls where we have seen other states recover and do better. Let's figure out what they have done so that we can apply it to the South and how we innovate using what is uniquely Southern to solve these problems going forward. Um, I know everyone's gonna have questions for Leader Abrams. I have a few more to ask, but if you wanna start putting your questions into the Q&A function below, uh, we'll continue to collect uh, those questions as we do a few more here uh, together. Um, Leader Abrams, talk a little bit about the role of innovation in the South. Where are you seeing innovations and where is there a gap that uh, needs to be filled? Well, as I said, there have been moments where the South has actually led the country. We know that Georgia, for example, created the Hope Scholarship, which provided access to education for college and community college students uh, at an unprecedented rate. We know that Tennessee led the way on community colleges. We know that across the South, we have seen 
very interesting ideas to try to solve immediate problems. Uh, I just referenced Randall Woodfin, the mayor of Birmingham, who created Birmingham Strong. And that was a program to hire those who were the most disaffected residents who were the least likely to get rehired or to receive services. And he's hired them in the midst of COVID-19 to provide access to economic stability. We know that across the South, innovation is how we have managed to solve some of the most intractable problems. We know that in North Carolina and in South Carolina, we have seen innovations on issues of access to energy and to energy security. We know that in Mississippi, there have been conversations about how you provide banking resources to returning citizens, those who serve their time, but are coming back and want to be re reintegrated. These are communities that are often, unfortunately, considered as afterthoughts, but they are critical parts of how you rebuild and how you, you structure a successful society. We know that CDFIs, the Community Development Financial Institutions, have been instrumental in providing access to resources for communities that are not traditionally banked. And so across the board, the South has leveraged innovation to solve challenges when they face an infrastructure that is both culturally and unfortunately resource wise, it seems to be impervious to the harms that are being created. I believe in the South Strong Initiative because it is, it's a coalition across 12 states of nearly 200 organizations and scholars who've been thinking about how do we solve these problems, not in spite of who we are, but leveraging who and what we are in the South. So I know another issue near and dear to your heart is the census, and the census has enormous economic implications as well as political implications. Could you say a little bit about how this census, both uh, how it's currently looking and could end up looking, what the implications would be for, for the South and particularly on the economics and politics of the South? Absolutely, and I, I want to, I would be remiss if I didn't thank you and the work of OSF in really trying to meet the crisis of the, the census in the 2020 census process. So here's the shorthand. Unfortunately, the Trump administration signaled early on that they intended to undermine the census. Uh, the most public event was the attempt to add a citizenship question, which would have allowed uh, or essentially would have uh, disproportionately pushed non-citizens out of providing information to the census, but it also would have affected their families who may or may not be residents or uh, citizens. And the intention was to undermine the accuracy of the census count. We know that at the same time, there was an underfunding of the census by more than $5 billion, which meant that we didn't have adequate time or adequate employment to actually meet what would be the largest census in American history. And then we fast forward, we got hit by COVID. But here's why the census matters. It's $1.5 trillion allocated every year. And those dollars pay for education, they pay for healthcare, they pay for roads and bridges, they pay for d disaster relief. All of those dollars are deployed for this purpose. And that's not including what we will know, we know will be billions of, if not trillions of dollars allocated for COVID recovery. And the allocation of all of those dollars, both the standard 1.5 trillion and the likely additional trillion dollars in 2021, 2022 for recovery will be based on the 2020 census count. But unfortunately, the count was, was disrupted by COVID-19. There was supposed to be a time period called the, the non, um, basically NARFU, it's, the, it's when the enumerators go out and start counting everyone. That, time period was artificially truncated by the Trump administration. It was truncated to September 30th instead of going to October 31st. While there has been legal action to force the census to continue through October 31st, we know through both anecdote and through real data that millions, or sorry, not millions, thousands of people who were hired for this purpose have actually either been let go or simply have not been resourced to continue this process. And for the South, this is deadly we are among the states that have the worst counts. And what that means in real politic is that we will not receive the funding necessary for recovery because the communities that are disproportionately undercounted in the census are the ones that are also disproportionately affected by COVID-19, which means they will face the greatest harm but receive the, the least benefit. And unfortunately, the Trump administration has shown no evidence of interest in actually getting an accurate count. And we're talking about states like Texas, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, basically the entirety of the South and, and unfortunately much of the Southwest 
when we think about what it means to recover from COVID, when we think about what it means to build a future for opportunity, if you have an undercount that not only ignores the economic effect, but also undermines the political power of these communities, it is deeply dangerous. And this is the last thing I'll say. We often think about this in terms of how do you reapportion Congress? How do we shift the 435 members of Congress so that those states that are going fastest get additional power, those who uh, have lower populations lose power. But redistricting that happens at the state and local levels affect almost every one of the decisions we need to make to actually create change. So going back to your question about whether recovery is a federal, state, or local issue, the fact that it's all of the above means that if you have a flawed census, that means you will have a flawed redistricting process. And while all of the attention is typically focused on what that means at the congressional level, we should be terrified about what it means at the state legislative level, because it's at the state legislative level in every one of the southern states that has refused to expand Medicaid that Medicaid expansion is decided. It is at the city council and county commission level that we make decisions about how we fund public health care systems, how we fund access to jobs programs. It's at the school district level that we decide who goes back to school, how, and how those classrooms are resourced. And so an undercount in the South could be the difference between life and death. And that is not hyperbole. That is the question of who gets elected to make choices and who they care about the most. And if you are not allowed to hire people through the election process who represent your values and represent your needs, then you are the most likely to be the victims of redistricting and not the beneficiaries. Uh, thanks, Madam Leader. We're going to open it up to the group here in, in a minute, and, a lot, and so please continue to put your questions in the Q&A. Um, but ask, uh, as we transition to that, what is a myth that people get wrong about the South, and what is something that they uh, get right about the South, um, that, uh, uh, whether that's a painful truth or, a, or an aspiration? Oh, I think the mythology is that the South is about black and white. Uh, that they're, and, and I mean that both in terms of race, in terms of ideology, in terms of process. And the reality is the South is deeply diverse. As I pointed out earlier, we are among the most diverse populations in the country. Georgia, for example, will be a majority minority, a, a majority minority state by the end of this decade. And what that means is that we are going to have not a single population with a majority, but we will see a plurality that requires the kind of negotiation and compromise that makes democracy work best. And I think there tends to be this underestimation of who we are and where we are in terms of growth. I think a truth about the South is that race and, race and poverty drive too many decisions. We often find ourselves making choices not because of the data, but because of long-held resentments and deep, deep cultural differences that have been allowed to be exacerbated instead of addressed. Often the notion is that the benefit of one community means the decimation of another. And we have to acknowledge that racism drives many conversations about who's entitled to progress. I believe in the South because I know of our diversity, I know of the changing demography, but I also know they're good hearted people of every race who want to see progress for all. But I'm also painfully aware that there are communities that are dead set against any communities other than their own achieving that progress and that often bleeds into our politics. And so the racism and the, the racist tropes that, are off, that often attend the South, they are not the whole of who we are, but we are being deeply disingenuous if we deny that they are part of who we are and that often flows into how we address poverty, which is, of course, you know, a persistent challenge in the South. That almost counts as a book uh, plug for Heather McGee's new book, The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together. Um, but uh, we have a, a set of great questions here. Um, one of the things you do so well, Stacy, is to tell stories that connect people to solutions. And you write stories, of course. What is, up? Oh, they just erased the question line for me. Uh, what is the new story of the South post COVID? How should ordinary, non-policy, non-political Americans understand the potential of the South? 
So when I created SEEP, it was of the, the sort of triad of entities, it was the last one that received public attention. But for me, it was incredibly important that we do it right. And that meant that while it launched at roughly the same time as Fair Fight and Fair Count, what we did instead of making this public announcement of our arrival was that we quietly traveled the South and had conversations with community organizations that were doing good work. We talked to those in quasi-governmental organizations. We talked to chambers of commerce. We had deep, rich conversations to ask the question, not who are you and what do you do, but what do you need? And that really became the architecture of SEEP. One of the, my favorite conversations that we are still embedded in is around Southern farmers, black farmers. Uh, there are 45,000 black farmers in the South, which is a woefully pitiful number given that in the 1920s, there were more than 1 million black farmers. But due to racism in the allocation of resources, due to challenges with things like air property, where we have a number of African-Americans who have inherited property over time, but not through the traditional estate process. They've been, unfortunately, uh, disinherited from their property, or they don't have the ability to leverage their property the way other farmers do. We've been tackling this challenge with them. How do you gather resources and deploy them to a population that is so essential to the health and welfare of our states? And of the 45,000 farmers, 90% of them are in the South. 45,000 black farmers, 90% in the South, but with a very weak access to the billions of dollars that are being allocated every year for our agriculture, for farmers. And so one of the opportunities we found is that we've used these conversations to understand what do they need. There are groups out there that are trying to do their best, but it's technical assistance. It's recognizing that a lot of USDA programs are on the web and most of those farmers do not have access to the internet because they live in communities that are basically in broadband deserts. And so they cannot get access to the resources they need. What excites me about this is that we are having conversations with them about how they grow their capacity, but we're also talking about what does it look like post COVID when resources are going to be made available, how do we get you into the queue so you can have access? That's the kind of exciting work that we get to do. And it's doing that across the South, meeting people where they are. Just last week, I did a program with the North Carolina Justice Center and Dr. William Barber, where we talked about how do we grow Medicaid? How do we insist that in this next iteration, with this next election, that we guarantee access to millions of Americans who are being denied health care because they haven't expanded Medicaid? My excitement about this and the stories we can tell about the growth we can have in the South begins with asking the question, how can I help? And using SEEP as a way to answer that question. And more importantly, leveraging SEEP to build South strong so that across the South, we are leveraging partnerships and collaboration as opposed to a single organization or a single source of resource, re, a single source of investment to get these answers. You have a question about what role uh, civics courses might play, particularly in the K through 12 uh, level um, for uh, changing the conversation in the South and engaging people at local, county, and state levels? Well, that begins with understanding what we are and how we're structured. Uh, you, you pointed out, I, I wrote a book called Our Time Is Now, Power, Purpose, and the Fight for Fair America, where I tried to engage the conversation of um, voter suppression, but also how do we leverage the census and identity to build a progressive future. But I also helped produce a documentary, as you, you playfully referenced earlier. And the reason for the documentary is that we have to meet people where they are. That means in the classroom, on the screen, in the bookshelves. And what All In is doing is not simply building the conversation about voting rights, but we actually built a, a curriculum. We're working with national teachers organizations to ensure that this curriculum can be deployed because we do have to begin by explaining who makes the choices. When I ran for governor, there was a lot of conversation, both when I ran and post running for governor, about other jobs I could have run for and other tools. And what I remind people of is that for the South, it is the governor and the state legislature that makes so many of the decisions that have essentially set our course. 
Stand Your Ground did not come from the federal government. It was a state law passed in Florida. The erosion of the social safety net didn't begin with the 96 Welfare Reform Act. It began with Tommy Thompson as governor of Wisconsin. Mass incarceration did not start with the 94 crime bill. It got its start in the 1970s with Ronald Reagan as governor of California changing the laws of who was incarcerated and at what rates. And Jim Crow never had a single federal law. We have to be more intentional in the South teaching the story of local politics, of local decision making. But more importantly, it has to be a conversation about power because too often the South serves as either a victim or a villain in the story of who we are. And we instead have to change this to be a question of citizenship. What does it mean to be Southern? What does it mean to be American? What does it mean to chart your own course, knowing that the greatest power in a democracy is not just the right to vote, it's the right to select those who will speak for you. And here's how you find out who they are, what they'll do, and how you hold them accountable. Uh, we have a question about universal basic income and whether you want to comment on it. The person recently watched the film Inherent Good, which is partly set in Tennessee and features a Mississippi basic income project, the Magnolia Mothers Trust, uh, with poor Black single mothers. Do you have any thoughts on UBI? I do. I think UBI is important as a conversation and as a construct for how we start to address uh, poverty and opportunity. The city of Atlanta is actually, there's a task force that's been built uh, in a combination of elected officials and civic organizations. Uh, we, are, uh, we are part of the evaluation team looking at what UBI looks, looking at how UBI could possibly work. I think we're using a very generic term to describe multiple iterations of what can happen. I'm very dear friends with Michael, with the mayor of Stockton and what he's been able to do there. And so I do think we have to get past this, in, this instinctive uh, opposition to the notion of cash relief benefits. We have to understand how it can work, how it can be scaled, how it should be deployed. And so I, I think the only way to know things is to investigate and to experiment. And so I'm very strongly supportive of the UBI experimentation. Uh, as we approach the upcoming election, there are a lot of fears about votes being counted. How can we as citizens help ensure that people's votes will be counted, whether by mail or in person? And separately, there's a question about whether grassroots groups can engage with SEEP. So two separate but related questions. So with Fair Fight, uh, you can help with the issue of uh, making sure that votes get counted. So Fair Fight is the organization I created that has a national focus on free and fair elections. We are recruiting heavily for volunteers to serve as observers, to serve as volunteers calling people, because the best way for us to guarantee an accurate and fair count in this election is to ensure that people know their rights and that they vote early. The earlier votes are cast, the earlier we can find mistakes, people have the opportunity to fix or to mitigate any harm, to cure their ballots. And so we need a lot of help getting good information out to people. We have to talk about this as an election season, not an election day. And as an election season, we have to think about election day as last call. And so a big part of what we need help with, and if you go to fairfight2020.org, you can sign up to be a volunteer. We can connect you with all of the resources that are not only available where you live, but if you wanna help across the country, we can deploy you. We can deploy you by text, by phone. And for those who physically wanna show up, we have a poll observer program that we're also helping to build to make sure that people have good information when they're standing in line, that they have the support they need. And unfortunately, because we know there is a very real intention to deploy poll watchers in 15 states that basically they've argued for a 50,000 person army that mimics a poll intimidation process that was used by the Republican National Committee in 1981. We want to make certain that we have people of good intention who want to make certain that everyone who is eligible can cast their votes. But here's the bottom line, do not panic. We have run elections during the Spanish flu, during civil war. It feels like we're in the midst of some variation on the theme in the midst of 2020, but the best way to ensure a fair and accurate election is to have overwhelming participation, to call out problems when we see them, and to support organizations that are doing their best. And if you wanna, so again, I urge you to go to fairfight2020.org to sign up to be a volunteer. And if you have any questions, you can call 866-OUR-VOTE, 866-OUR-VOTE for information, or go to vote.org for more information about voting where you live. 
Second question, we would love to have your support with SEED. Uh, the Southern Economic Advancement Project is exactly that. We are working across the South and we want, we are comprised of a small mighty team that's helping groups uh, that are deploying resources, but we also need your help. Um, South, the South Strong Initiative, if you go to southstrong.org, you can sign up and become part of the South Strong Initiative and we would love to be in touch with you. I'm gonna give you the name of our, uh, our community engagement director. Her name is Jenny Castillo and you can reach her at Jenny at theseep.org, Jenny at theseep.org and we'd be happy to engage you and get you involved. Um, the Jenny, issue of climate- Me right now, but she's really good at what she does. Yeah. Um, the issue of climate change is obviously global, but it has regionally disparate impacts. I know two of the most vulnerable coastlines in the United States are uh, 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 Louisiana um, and the Newport News area of Virginia. Um, talk a little bit about how climate change is affecting the economy of the South and how much that may be part of the economic future. The first major research paper that we released through C because here, here's what we do. We're, we provide technical assistance to organizations. We provide research analysis and we provide financial support and comms support for deploying information or closing that last gap in really thoughtful programs being done by local organizations to solve problems endemic to the South. But the research piece to me is critically important because often you have really thoughtful minds but getting permission or having the ability to focus on the intersection of policy and political reality in the South is hard. The way I describe SEEP is that we translate progressive into Southern. And doing that on the issue of climate action has been incredibly important because we have to recognize that for the South, climate action isn't simply about how do you meet the, the ravages of climate change, it's also an economic issue that a lot of the folks in the South are employed either directly or indirectly by the energy industry in various forms. And so this notion of wholesale change has to be met with the reality of how do you make certain that those who are already on the bubble economically aren't completely cast aside. And so if you go to seep.org, the seep.org, you can find our, our climate change policy, but here's what we say. One, that much like everything in the South, Climate inaction has both a racial and an economic component. It is harming communities of color most, most effectively, and it, it harms the poor. We see that, to your point, uh, when we think about vulnerable coastlines, we see that with every hurricane, we see that with every, you know, we had tornadoes in the South. We see that when there are natural disasters because we have the least resilient populations to those natural disasters because of the weakness of our infrastructure. But we also have seen opportunities for advancement. And whether you're looking at what's been done in North Carolina, as I mentioned earlier, they've taken some energy policy initiatives that are very important. We have seen protections in Florida for the coastline, Florida and uh, Georgia trying to protect the coastlines. We are watching Louisiana try to take steps on climate action. We have to understand again, both the economic piece and the disproportionate harm that affects communities of color. But we also know that because we're a largely agricultural region, that there are opportunities to use agriculture to improve climate action in the South, that we can use building codes to improve access, that mass transit would be transformational in the South because this is a region that heavily depends on cars and that even in smaller communities, simply having access to a bus route could change the economy of an entire community. And so we are very much focused on the importance of climate action and understanding that climate change and that climate response in the South has to have a very particular lens. Uh, we were proud to work with two great researchers and we're continuing to turn out information. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is that in the midst of COVID-19, we know that for a number of communities, utility bills are one of the hardest drivers of their economic insecurity. They cannot afford the current charges. And while there are some regions that voluntarily suspended utility charges, most of those are dissipating just as we head into a season where COVID will surge again, but so will heating prices, so will the cost of gas. And so we have to pay attention to the immediacy of climate action, but also to the drivers of those climate dollars 
and make certain that we are thinking about how this is disproportionately affecting communities that are the least resilient to COVID-19. Um, thank you for that. Uh, another um, participant says, women are really being left behind during this economic disaster. What can be done to address the childcare crisis and how do we make sure that we don't go backwards on gender equity? One of the first investments we made in SEEP was in the North Carolina, uh, was a North Carolina project that looks at how we get state and local actors to actually invest in childcare. And so the entity we funded, they're wrapping up their program and we're going to use their findings to actually share that information with other organizations across the South. Because part of what we do is when we invest, the investment is that we're gonna connect you to a network that needs to know what you know and needs to be able to replicate what you've done. But the larger issue, of course, is one that is unfortunately you know, part and parcel of, of you know, national inattention to childcare needs and to the challenges that women in particular face in the workplace. We know that absence of childcare means that women are often unable to work outside of the home. And because a lot of women, especially women of color, are at the you know, bottom of the economic rung, they fall off the ladder if they can't access this. And with the closure of schools, with kids being in virtual school instead of being actually able to go to a physical place, and with the collapse, and let's be clear, we have seen a collapse of childcare services. And so we have to make certain that in the next administration, that in the, health, the COVID recovery process, that we intentionally rebuild the childcare industry. Because let's say it. Not only do women rely on it, but women are disproportionately represented in the supply. And so that fixing that supply chain, fixing that infrastructure and that architecture, right sizing the revenue, making certain that those who work for childcare in the childcare industry or who are the purveyors that they can actually pay their workers a living wage with access to healthcare. Those are things we can solve. Going back to my very first statement, we can solve those by using this crisis, not to simply restore what we had, but to build what we've always needed. And that's going to require very strong intentionality. And it's part of the conversation we're having with South Strong. Um, uh, I think speaking for all of us, I was very sorry Stacey Abrams was not elected in 2018, though she kind of was. Uh, it is over 30 years ago that Doug Wilder was elected governor of Virginia. How long will we have to wait for another African-American to be elected to a Southern governorship? I don't know, but I, I hope it's not long. I mean, look, I, I've not yet decided what my next step will be, but I believe that the diversity we're seeing in the U.S. Senate races is a strong signal of what's possible. Uh, at this moment in the South, we have Black gubernatorial, we have Black Senate candidates in Florida, sorry, not Florida, in Georgia, Mississippi, uh, South Carolina, Louisiana, Tennessee. That speaks very highly to the evolving nature of what a statewide candidate can accomplish. And, and let's be clear, the challenge running for governor as a black candidate, particularly as a black woman, but writ large as a black candidate, is often whether or not you can win a statewide election. The demography of our states have, I think, evolved such that both the demography and the sophistication of our candidates meets this moment. And we will start to see more and more black candidates successfully vie for statewide elective office, particularly for the top of the ticket runs for US Senate and for governor. I'll put in a little plug for the Commonwealth of Virginia there. We not only made history with Wilder, but we have two very strong black women running for governor uh, next year in Virginia. Um, and there can be a tendency if the White House shifts for there to be a backlash uh, next year politically. And I'm curious, as you're seeing progress across the South, you're seeing uh, this national uprising around racial justice, how much do you feel like the country as a whole and the South is on a steady progression forward towards a more inclusive and progressive future? Or uh, do you live in fear that at any moment we could see uh, you know, a backlash to the progress that's been made? Well, I, I am from the South, so I always hear a backlash. Um, <laughs> but, but as I, I very intentionally say, knowing something could go wrong is not an excuse for not attempting to make it right. And if you look at both the demographic changes, the economic changes, 
and the political might that has grown dramatically since the Voting Rights Act, we have seen more and more opportunity for people of color, namely African Americans, but across the spectrum, for people of color to be in positions of power to not only help create progress, but to serve as a bulwark against a complete backlash. Of course, the last four years have you know, decimated faith that backlashes are survivable, but that's why I believe so much in the ecosystem of organizations that I created, because it's not enough to want it to be so. We have to work to make it so. And so fighting for access to free and fair elections is a critical piece. If you do not attack the fundamentals of voter suppression, which largely target communities of color, then yes, you are going to be able to face, you're absolutely going to face a backlash as they attempt to take away any rights and any progress that have been achieved. The census is a critical piece of it because it's how we set the political chess table for the next decade. And I do not want all of us to serve simply as pawns. And then the work of SEEP is about how we then build the policies that we can leverage when we have both the political might and the resources that come from the census. And so in my mind, it's of a piece. We absolutely have the ability to withstand a backlash. But part of the challenge for the South is that we are constantly fighting to protect what we have and envision what we want. And my mission is to ensure that that envisioning process happens while we move forward. And it's not simply a construct of the mind, but is instead a construct of activity that we are able to employ every day. Let me ask you about a tension that came up in one of the questions where, you know, we have this terrible uh, tradition across the country, and particularly in the South, of tracking kids into educational programs, what used to be called, say, SHOP. And some arguing we've now overcorrected and not had enough opportunities of multiple pathways to career and technical training. How do we get the balance right of making sure we're creating uh, multiple pathways to different kinds of careers and futures while avoiding the, tra the incredibly pernicious tracking systems that have been so problematic in the past? I, I argue, first of all, that children need to be made aware of opportunities early enough but they shouldn't have to make choices so early that they don't have the ability to correct. Uh, I, I have um, a relative who has been you know, tracked for one thing and realized that she wanted something else, but she didn't know in time to be able to, shape, to change her mind. A 14 year old should not be bound by a decision made at that age. And so my belief is that our education system should be providing that base, not just the baseline, but should be for providing the depth of education that allows you to decide to follow a track when you're in, when you're, you know, 16 or 17, but should not bind you to that decision based on what you were at the age of 13 or 14. And so it is, there's a nonsensical approach that is being taken at this point that says, that we want you to know so early that we forget that the whole point of education is to help you form your mind and understand your options. Uh, I wouldn't take away those options, but I would make certain that a child isn't forestalled from changing his or her mind because one option they chose, you know, robbed them of the education they need to make a shift. Yeah, no, it's, it's, um, uh, it's an incredibly important issue in terms of that question of not, of giving people options for as long as possible. And I think it goes back to your question about, uh, or point about the underinvestment in public infrastructure and public education. When you're making decisions among scarcity uh, for kids' education, you've already lost the battle in many ways for economic opportunity. Uh, as opposed to be giving, uh, ensuring people have a plethora of time and, and time and space to grow as well. What, um, as we're wrapping up here, what do you see right now as being um, uh, the most important thing that's at stake in this election for Southern economic development? There are many things at this election, we know the stakes in general, um, but in a first hundred days, what do you think are, uh, or a first year of an administration uh, what would be some of the most impactful things that could be done for Southern uh, economic progress? Well, I, I'm going to borrow your phrase because I think it, it applies writ large. It's this notion of a scarcity of resources, but what I'm most fearful of is a scarcity of resources coupled with a poverty of imagination. And in the first 100 days, 
if we tackle the infrastructure of resources, you also then decimate the poverty of imagination. That is, we create a system of democracy that can withstand a Supreme Court that decides that racism no longer exists. And that happens if you have a federal law that does not permit the most pernicious purveyors of voter suppression to operate with impunity simply because there hasn't been a Jim Crow, you know, flare up in 60 years or 50 years, namely because you had a law that said it couldn't happen. And so we still need the Voting Rights Advancement Act, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act to pass. But if we had fundamental baseline democratic principles involved, same day registration, automatic registration, limiting the closure of polling places, requiring equity of resources and federal funding thereof in our elections, creating a baseline for democracy in America changes a lot because so much of our energy is spent trying to be able to access elections that we rarely have time and opportunity to imagine what an election can yield. So that's number one. Number two is that any economic solution to the South or national solution has to take into account the vagaries of regions. The South does not have a strong infrastructure with labor unions. Therefore, any policies that are premised on the notion that labor can step in or that labor exists has to understand that there are entire swaths of our country where we are still playing catch up to the 1920s and that in terms of worker protections. And so we have to right size our unemployment system. We have to right size our public safety net. We have to demand access to healthcare for all. And if that means putting in, we can't do incentives for Medicaid expansion, but there can absolutely be a public option that I would hope would supersede the need for Medicaid expansion and the recalcitrance we're seeing, that solves that part of the problem. And then third, we have to absolutely focus relentlessly on the needs of the South. Um, there's a Black Belt Commission that is similar to the Appalachian Regional Commission, so Black Belt Regional Commission, similar to the Appalachian Regional Commission, which is an entity that was created more than a decade ago designed to invest in the South. It has never received its at its fair allocation. I think the most it received was half a million, maybe a million dollars, but this can be an entity that can have laser focus on the challenges of the South, rebuilding the South, addressing the, the issues that are endemic to the South. And one of my missions is going to be to look at how we ensure that the Black Belt Regional Commission actually get the resources it needs. And the plan will be to deploy those resources based on the South Strong Initiative, because by the end of our initiative, we are going to have a litany of things that need to be done, but with a very strong architecture for how and why and how much, uh, because we can solve these problems. The United States in the midst of recovery is not going to suffer from a lack of resources. It's going to suffer from a lack of imagination and a lack of will. And so our responsibility is to thwart that and to say that where the South goes, the nation goes. We saw that happen in COVID-19, and we can see that happen with COVID recovery. Well, it's incredibly powerful, and I want to give you a chance to close with calling people to action, but I will say on the question of the South and backlash, I still think there are a few phrases that are more indicative of American history than the first since, first blank since Reconstruction. Uh, when it's the first Black elected to this position since Reconstruction, and you're talking about the fact that we are celebrating getting back to something somewhere we were over a century ago. And so we know these have cycles, but we also uh, know that there really are genuinely uh, trajectories forward. And that's not a matter of destiny. It's been people make the decision uh, to step up, get involved, um, and ensure that we are a more perfect union. And so I would love uh, for you, Leader Abrams, to leave us with some marching orders. Uh, what are the most important things we can be doing uh, as academics, as citizens, and otherwise here in the days ahead and the years ahead? Well, first of all, I wanna say thank you again, Tom, for guiding this conversation, for the support that you've given to SEEP. Of course, I wanna thank the Roosevelt Institute, Felicia in particular for being willing to serve as an incubator for this project and to all of the members of South Strong, the South Strong Initiative. As I said, the challenge is not that we don't know what to do. It is often that we are so hungry for resources and so desperate for attention that we make compromises on what we ask for, what we think is possible. 
And part of what I want to do with, with SEAT, part of what we have tried to build is a, a bit of a, a break front so that organizations that have brilliant ideas but are so busy trying to keep the lights on that they can't think that they have a place to come where we can be a partner in closing that gap and being that bridge and being a thought partner. Uh, but we are not a funding organization. We do micro grants, not major grants. But in that, what we can do and what we have demonstrated our capacity to be is that we can help articulate what the challenges are, but also articulate where the gaps have been for those who have seen themselves as investors or supporters or believers for so long, but have not seen measurable change. It's the understanding that that last mile, that that bridge that has to be crossed isn't just a stream, it's a chasm. And it's a chasm that is created by state, federal, and local policies, but these are solvable problems. And my mission as someone who, as you pointed out, I'm, of, I'm a daughter of the South, I was a deputy city attorney in the South, I was a legislator in the South, and I will always be of the South, that we need all the partners we can get. We can solve these problems. And some of these are problems that can be solved by individual organizations, but many of these problems require a collective investment and a collective attention that allows those organizations to focus on what they do while we think about how we can make what they do even stronger. And so I just encourage everyone to reach out to us at theseep.org, to reach out to me, to reach out to Jenny, and we look for all the partners and friends we can have because the South is strong. We just need the space to show it. Thank you so much. May your ideas spread like kudzu across the South and may everyone have a wonderful, blessed day. Thank you to Roosevelt. Thank you, Leader Abrams. Thank you so much, Tom. Take care, everyone.